We're just trying to change the world here, people. Oh, really? Law and order segment. Welcome back to a really radio 133. Uh, this is our law and order segment for November 18th, 2016, where we dismantle the current events for your entertainment through mostly rational conversation that make you go, oh, really? I'm still your host, Andy Cowan, and I still have my usual suspects, Fred Sims, Daniel Atherton, and Steve McGurfith. Welcome back, gentlemen. And uh, let's see. So uh, this is basically the Trump segment. Trump plus Michigan. Yes. Uh, should we do Michigan first, since we were talking about uh, Certainly. spoiled water in uh <laughs> Yeah. In the last one, let's let's well, go we'll right cut into straight that. Straight to the end, and then go back to the top. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, one of these things is not like the other. One of these things does not belong. So here we are back in Flint, Michigan. Oh, by the way, they still don't have clean drinking water. Yeah. Uh, um, Detroit Free Press is uh, where this comes out of. Uh, right now, the administration of Governor Rick Snyder moved today to block a federal court order forcing the state officials to deliver bottled water to flood residents who don't have properly installed and maintained water filters on their kitchen taps. Uh, the state's legal filing seeks to stay the preliminary injunction issued last week pending an appeal in the case. Uh, U.S. District Judge David Lawson last Thursday ruled that the state and the city of Flint must, effective immediately, deliver four cases of bottled water per resident per week to qualified Flint households. Oh, wow. That's that's pricey. Yeah, but they don't want to do it, even though it's them that's caused this crisis. <sighs> Quote, It's sad that the state of Michigan continues to disenfranchise the community of Flint. One of the plaintiffs, Pastor Alan Overton of the Concerned Pastors for Social Action, uh, said of the state's legal move. Quote, what happened to Governor Snyder's pledge that he would work to fix Flint's drinking water crisis? This action today inflicts more harm on a city that's already hurting. Yeah. Oh, Michigan gets federal okay to spend $119 million on lead abatement. Judge says Flint water allegations shock the conscience. Well, yeah, those are related stories that you could dive into. Uh, oh, by the way, Detroit Free Press, uh, if you were listening earlier um, to our show A, it is one of the sites that was listed in the uh, the ones that you should watch out for because it has a very, you know, left-wing bias. Um, that doesn't mean that the reporting's wrong. Well, unless it's election night and the Detroit Free Press calls Michigan for Hillary um, hours before it's actually called for Trump. Fair. Well, you know, they, they get it wrong. So, yeah. Um, uh, so, what? I just don't even know where to begin. No, that the in, headline in, in alone, analyzing Flint. The headline alone is deplorable. Like your entire state is battling getting water to those that need it most. Yeah, they don't want to foot the bill. They don't care about these people. None. No. The this, re- this is the, 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 the dis- Detroit level dystopia that we saw in Robocop come to life. Yeah. And it's still in Michigan. The Herculean effort required by the court order would be on the magnitude of a large scale military operation, said Heaton. In addition to delivering cases of water in extreme quantities, extreme quantities, the state would have to address the full-time canvassing of homes to determine the ongoing status of water filters and deal with the potential public health risk from millions of empty water bottles suddenly flooding Flint's trash and recycling system. Well, that's true. Yes, you would have to deal with those. Maybe you ought to just go ahead and pull up the damn pipes and replumb the city. Because it's going to end up being cheaper to do that in the long run. If they keep up like this. The resources to accomplish this would only be available through the activation of the National Guard or the hiring of several logistics companies with the necessary equipment and personnel to achieve this unprecedented level of effort. How about just a recurring subscription to Amazon? uh, Well, beyond, I'm also going, oh, can I say, oh, job creation? (laughs) But that would involve spending money. And they're obviously, they don't want to spend any money. That's how we got to this crisis. That's how we got here in the first place, yeah. 
Oh. It's a poor community, and they don't care about poor people. The speed of the city's recovery, state officials argue, will depend on how often they use tap water that has been filtered. What? I, I'm trying to figure out that, that statement. So right, they're, say it again. They're victim blaming. That's yeah. what they're doing. They're yeah. victim blaming. Yeah, say it one more time. The speed of the city's recovery, state officials argue, will depend on how often they use tap water that has been filtered. That by its what? base <laughs> assertion is true. But that However, that also means that we're not going to clean up the pipes. We want you to install filters at your house. Yeah, that's that's not yeah, that's, eliminating that's the problem. It on the, the citizen that you've screwed. Yeah, that's literally what it is. That you've and it, and permanently it, damaged with lead poisoning. And it doesn't yes. change. I mean, it only changed your tap water. You're still getting that nasty, disgusting brown water out of your bath. You know, your but shower. It, yeah. It, it doesn't fix the water problem. They and they're not going to fix the water problem. They rather you either a move die, yeah, or b move. They don't care. The 2014 population, the census um, for Flint was 99,000 people. So if every one of them were to get this allotment, which you know they said it wasn't everybody, it, it was households that fit the criteria. It would be 396,000 cases of water a week. Yeah. That's a lot. That's a lot of a bottles. A case of water, even at Walmart, is in the like 3 to $4 range. Yeah. So you're talking about a million dollars in, in water to just to per week. They argued the cost of delivering water to households would be $9 million per month. Uh, I don't know how they, just the cost to buy based off of my numbers, if it were every citizen off the census is only 4 million to buy and that's every citizen. So that number is, well, they're, they're talking arranging for delivery, all the logistics and, you know, warehousing of the water in order to have fulfillment and, and, you know, all that. And also being able to assess each household and which ones need, which ones do not. Yeah. And, and save yourself all that money and just give it to everybody. Yeah. Uh, so Flint's water became contaminated with lead in April of 2014. This is November 2016. Uh, after months of denials <laughs> amid public complaints about the color, taste, and odor of the water, state officials acknowledged the public health crisis on October 1st, 2015. The contamination happened when the city was under the control of a state-appointed emergency manager and switched its water source to the Flint River as a temporary cost-cutting measure. The State Department of Environmental Quality has acknowledged it made a mistake when it didn't require corrosion control chemicals as part of the treatment process, resulting in toxic lead leaching from pipes, joints, and fixtures. Just to, as a reminder of what the entire crisis is all about which is cutting corners and cutting costs killing customers basically because yeah because it's about the corporate yeah. interests we care about not yeah. the people yeah just look up lead poisoning if you're curious as to what's going on just look it up go ahead pause the podcast. it's horrific come back and they're and they're doing it to their people and they have no qualms about it. To the children. The children are the most vulnerable because it's happening to, you know, very young children and they have already shown cognitive problems. This is going to affect them for the rest of their lives. Yeah. And then they will become the problem of the state. Because maybe the parents are, well, the parents are going to age out and then they will just be wards of the state unable to take care of themselves. Yeah. Good job. State emergency managers. Good job. Um, yeah. Despite the substantial efforts of Captain uh, 
Kelsnick, yeah, of the Michigan State Police and others, it is clear that some residents who are actively seeking safe drinking water are encountering great difficulty. He said uh, he heard testimony that some residents have stopped calling 201 for the water delivery uh, because of frustrations with the response, and others don't know the services even available. A safe water supply has always been critical to civilization, Lawson said in granting the order sought in a lawsuit brought by concerned pastors of social change, uh, for social change. Um, defendants in the lawsuits are state treasurer uh, Nick Corey and state and city mem- members of the receivership transli- transition, transition, transition advisory, advisory board. board. Overseeing Flint as it emerges from the state-ordered emergency management. So, even though the city is under emergency management in its entirety to make amends, they're still screwing over the, the people of Flint. Oh, <laughs> Flames coming from the side of my face. <sighs> so that's um, that's Michigan. That's Flint, Michigan. It's still a problem. Congratulations. Okay, so now on to better, worse news. Depending on how you look at it, I guess. There is less <laughs> lead poisoning in this news. Yeah, I, I guess. Yeah, that's 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 a difference. That is a difference. OK, so uh, just just a, a quick rundown of the things that Donald Trump ha- is up to. Uh, he moved to settle the multiple lawsuits uh, involving Trump University uh, so that it won't go to trial so that a president elect will not have to, you know, face a jury and a judge. Uh, He also continues his suit against Washington, D.C. over hotel taxes. And let's see. Also uh, on climate change, um, apparently, uh, well, let's see. There's a real possibility of causing, you know, all-out financial war with Europe Europe, uh, based on if he walks, if he has the United States walk away from the Paris Accords, there's going to be some serious hell to pay there. And also, you're already um, hearing from France that there will be a seven percent carbon tax on all U.S. goods. That's there's a trade policy. Good job, guys. Good job. It's not a tariff. It's a carbon tax. Yeah. Um, so perfectly legal. And with that carbon tax, you know, in in relation to that. Representatives from 47 of the world's most disadvantaged nations have pledged to generate all of their future energy needs from renewables. Um, Morocco's building a, a solar farm you can see from space. That's awesome. And they're in the it right will power zone for the it. entire nation and they'll sell what's ever left over to their neighbors. Why aren't we doing this? Congratulations, United States. When the poorest countries can do... What you all say is too damned expensive. My only real words to you are, shut the hell up. It's it's all about uh, priorities. It's just priorities. Uh, whereas Trump wants to try to reinvigorate clean coal, which hey. won't happen, by the way. You know, as, as much as he tries to do it. Also, let's get it right. It doesn't actually exist. Well, clean coal is a process. It is not a thing. It is a process of scrubbing out the carbon after it's been used and then sequestering it again. It's enormously expensive to do. Beyond it that, doesn't, though, it doesn't the, work the very well. Me is they don't view the idea of the, how much carbon it takes to yeah. harvest the coal. Right. Right. All of this. All of the things around it means that it doesn't happen. So it's a myth. Can it happen? Yes. Does it happen in practice? No. It never has. Feel free and look it up. It. No one has done it because 
renewables are less expensive than manufacturing processes for clean coal. It's a numbers game. You get all the MBAs in the room together, and they say, why were we going to bother with that? That's more expensive. It would be cheaper to invest in solar. Yeah. So the coal miners are going to have to get up and move because those mines are going to shut down. I'm sorry. Yeah, also, congratulations. there's not that much coal Trump. left. Well, oh, beyond that, no, congratulations, plenty. Trump plenty. did lie you know, about that. The jobs yeah. are not coming back. I don't care how bad you want them or how much that was what got your vote. Those jobs ain't ever coming back. It's, you know, <clears throat> I got to give him something here. He didn't lie. He didn't know. He didn't understand. Ignorance is not an excuse. You're running for president. Thank you. I know, but that's that's his entire platform. What, ignorance is an excuse? Trump 2016, ignorance is my excuse? I think that works, yeah. I think that works, because he doesn't know. He does not know. And he is on the level of ignorant about the job so much that he doesn't know what he couldn't possibly know. You know, as, as you become educated on things, you learn what you didn't know. And you learn how much more there is to know about something. He's not even on that on that field. He hasn't even cracked the book yet. He, he hasn't even like signed up. He hasn't even signed up for the class, much less shown up to the university, Trump University. That is. No, we already have have <laughs> direct statement from him. He doesn't yep. like to read. That. And- that's not the role model I want to have for our country. And you know what? He doesn't like to read. He wants summaries just told to him. Well, beyond that, the fact that he wants his children to have top secret clearance. And they're still going to be in charge of all of his funds, and that's not a conflict of interest. Him meeting with the Japanese prime minister with his daughter in the room. Well, beyond that, it's also... Okay, so you want your kids to have have access, in have uh, top secret security clearance. Okay, I can name three children who lived in the White House who did not get top secret security clearance or any clearance. Uh, Chelsea Clinton and the Obama girls. Yeah, but the thing is, I think over the over the course of many years, uh, Mr. Trump. Has you know before he's president elect, he has already outsourced parts of his brain to his children. Yeah, there are things that I don't think he can function with, and you know it, it's it's a sign he's he's narcissistic. I'm not saying that as an insult. I'm saying it as a fact. He simply mm-hmm. is. All people that run to be the president of the world, basically have a bit of narcissism in them. You got to. It's part of the gig. We understand this. So, as such, and the way that he's developed, you know, his personality and and the way that we've seen it come out through this election season, he wants control over everything. He wants to do it himself. He still manages his um, his own Twitter account until his campaign took it away because they thought it was unstable. You know, he was managing it all. He would outsource it to trusted people. And then, as he continued to get out of his depth, he continued to outsource it to more and more people. More people came into the trust circle. But who was in the trust circle first? Who does he think that he can trust more than anyone else? His family. The people who he put the silver spoon in their mouth. They're the only ones that he thinks he can trust in this world. So this this makes sense. It's not right, but I can understand where it's coming from. On the books, you can't appoint a family member. Really to a lot of the different positions. I don't know. I'm pretty sure he doesn't know what laws those are. I can't quote them. I don't know where they are. I'm sure they exist because nepotism exists and, you know, it is certainly frowned upon 
in even corporate structures. But this is the United States government. Of course, we could always look back at the Kennedys. You know, we know that there's there's a bit of legacies involved there, family legacies. But, you know, uh, the Kennedys, at least, they, they kind of knew what they were doing. You know, that they, they built up their own reputations individually. Yeah. Uh, the entire Trump clan has not had any public service at all. They've only been corporate entities. And most of them have never actually tried to apply for an actual job. Uh, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Remember, for everybody out there who's wondering, remember, the presidential election was the first time Trump Sr. ever applied for a job. Wow. That's... Well, he's got a good track record. Every job he's applied for, he's gotten. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, so that's frightening. So um, into, into actually what happened with, um, with his lawsuits, uh, he reversed course and agreed on Friday to pay $25 million to settle a series of lawsuits stemming from his defunct for-profit education venture, Trump University, finally putting to rest the fraud allegations by former students, which have dogged him for years and hampered his presidential campaign. Um, the settlement was announced by the New York Attorney General just 10 days before one of the cases, a federal class action lawsuit in San Diego, was set to be heard by a jury. Uh, the deal averts a potential embarrassing and highly unusual predicament, a president-elect on trial, and possibly even taking the stand in his own defense while scrambling to build his incoming administration. So, yeah. Because he, he tried to get a stay and delay and the judges were like no yeah so do you think that 25 million came out of his own pocket or do you think it came out of his foundation <laughs> uh, it won't be out of his own pocket and it won't be out of the foundation it'll be out of corporate coffers right yeah whatever entity absorbed the the liquid assets from trump university yeah. It, yeah. it, will, it'll, it will be from that. He will take a, a minor write-off. hit. He'll take a write-off it, at the end. Yeah. This will actually serve his taxes. Yes, it will serve his taxes. Yeah. This, this, this actually be a benefits corporate loss. Him. Yeah, this benefits him at the end of the year. Isn't that... Doesn't... Doesn't that suck? <laughs> yeah, no, this is a... No, yeah. Because it will be paid from corporate funds, this will be a corporate loss. So you'll be able to write off his business expense. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So that's Trump University. That's just scratch that off the list of things that uh, that yeah. he has to deal with. And then there's the <coughs> continuing suit for uh, the uh, for Washington D.C. Uh, the hotel in D.C. Um, is is suing because they say they're being overtaxed. That DC is overtaxing the hotel. Okay. Now the suit was originally tossed out. Now they are bringing the suit back for each parcel of land that the hotel is on. Wow. Yeah. Filing each one individually. The hotel in question is located in the old post office building, a federal property that Trump Post Office LLC rents from the U.S. <laughs> Wait, Trump Post Office LLC rents from the U.S. General Services Administration, or GSA. In two months, Donald Trump will have the power to appoint the head of the GSA, which yep. would handle any contract negotiations with the hotel, which will apparently be controlled at that point by a trust run by the president's children. We will see every day. This is the How is this conflict. not a conflict of interest? This is the, the direct conflict of interest. It's so amazing. This is amazing. <clears throat> uh, but that's that's... 
all to come. Back in June, uh, Trump's team argued that its $1.7 million annual tax bill in 2015 and 2016 was too high because the hotel was only partially completed at the time. It doesn't matter. You're paying taxes on the land uh, use. Okay. Um, They also said the lease, which the city assessed at $98 million and lowered to $91 million on appeal, was only worth about $28 million. This is standard Trump operating procedure, saying that it's going to be one price and then saying, nah, it's not worth that, I'll only pay you a third. Yeah. A third seems to be what his going rate is for settling things like this. But he's the contract is with the government, who he's renting the parcel from. So the so, government keeps saying no, yeah. but now he is the government. And here's where we have a conflict of interest, right? Yeah. It would seem to make sense that that would be a conflict of interest. Oh, okay. So, <clears throat> on to Paris. On to Paris. Um, if America walks away from its climate obligations, the consequences could be very expensive. On Sunday, former French President Nicolas Sarkozy suggested imposing a carbon tax on U.S. goods if Trump walks away from the Paris Climate Agreement. Sarkozy is currently competing for the presidential nomination of France's center-right Republican Party. Under the Paris Agreement, which went into effect earlier this month, so it's already in effect, folks, countries pledged to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions in an effort to limit global warming to 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit above pre-industrial levels. During the campaign, uh, Trump pledged to cancel the deal. Sarkozy said that if Trump abandons the agreement, European countries should impose a 1% to 3% tax on American goods, uh, according to the French newspaper Le Monde. Le Monde. Uh, The goal would be to protect European businesses that will be abiding by the global climate agreement from being undercut by U.S. industries that won't be subject to emissions limits. That makes perfect sense. That's, that is something that we would do to other countries should they yeah. renege. Hit, them in the, hit us in the pocketbook. That's the only way that we listen. Um, now, yeah. Another interesting thing when it comes to Sarkozy um, while he, he was a climate denier early on, mm-hmm. uh, in the upcoming elections, he's thrown his hat back in the ring. Yeah. So he may become the next uh, president-elect of France. So this is somebody that we may be having to deal with. And he's already going, go ahead, back out, carbon tax. And I will tell you that if France does it, they're not the only European nation that's going to do it. No, especially given that it was the Paris Climate Agreement. Yeah. Though though that's a name only, really, you know, it doesn't really matter, but it does it carries the weight of mind on it. Yeah. So it will it will carry the carry it further. Three percent tax on American goods along with the TTP. Well the TPP, Trans Pacific Partners, TPP. Um and the TTIP. Yeah. It's like, wait, am I getting the, getting the letters right? Well, those are basically falling to pieces. Nobody's backing yeah. them anymore. Um, it, 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 the, the emperor has no clothes when it yeah. comes to those agreements. Yeah. Uh, the world's finding out about them and going, oh. Well, then, Corporate interests are being forced to back out of them because they're so unpopular, even though it would give them immense power. Yeah. They don't want to, but again, public public perception. They'll still make the same backroom deals, and they'll have the equivalents of these because they've already built those relationships. So there will be something on the table for them, I'm sure. Um, yeah, but not to the degree in sweeping powers that no, were in. Those yeah, they, they won't have the the ability to uh, you know take sue a governments. Yeah, to sue entire governments over a uh, a bad deal. Which was a bad idea in the first place. That's a terrible idea. So, yeah, that's that's crazy. 
and then and then of course the um, the lesser nations building 100% green energy. This is that's it's a wonderful way to end this. Um, in that they're going to be the green pioneers and actually oh. work to be even better to overshoot and overcome the Paris Accords. It it makes perfect sense though. I, I, again, I'm I'm I, I I keep pushing myself further and further into economics. This makes perfect sense. Uh, if you want, as a, a a middling or or poorer nation, want to dig your yourselves up, mm-hmm. dig yourselves out. Investing in green energy right now is the way to go. You will become pioneers in this technology, which eventually the rest of us are going to have to adopt. Essentially, as like you and I have discussed, Dan, it's the idea of forget the whole let's go with the standard model of industrialization where you go through your own industrial age and everything else and all the coal. And all that. Say, no, no, screw that. Go with we've got this high tech green energy and everything else. Yeah. Start there. And then move forward. That right. way you skip yeah. all the crap. And oh look, you're now leaders in this industry. Well, just like which I'll, means that we'll come to you to get that technology, and other developing nations will come to you to go, hey, and look, you go up. It's amazing how this works. Yeah, and we've seen emerging nations. They're not running, you know, copper, you know, phone lines and telegraph cables and all that that oh. we had to do. No, they're going straight wireless, just immediately wireless towers, and that's it. The entire nation is wireless to begin with. Their first phone is is a cell phone. And it makes things so much easier. Yeah. They're doing uh, it, they're it, doing banking by phone. Yeah. It makes things to get into the global market easier. Mm-hmm. It's expediting the industrialization process. Yeah. It's also creating jobs for their own people and making those people who are in those green fields people to be sought after by other nations. You're coming to us for the brains and the know-how. You'll well, be forced to. Yeah, what we're looking at here is the Climate Vulnerable Forum. So it's uh, 47 of the world's most disadvantaged nations are apparently part of the CVF, Climate okay. Vulnerable Forum. Um Bangladesh, Ethiopia, and Haiti, among others, say that they will update their national plans on cutting carbon before 2020. Delegates here welcomed the move, saying it was inspirational. Uh, These two weeks of negotiations have been overshadowed to an extent by the reaction of the election of Donald Trump at the U.S. presidency. But in an effort to show that even the world's poorest countries are committed to dealing with global warming, the Climate Vulnerable Forum members have issued a promise to fully green their economies between 2030 and 2050. So that's that's a ways away, but at least they're working towards it. Uh, termed the Marrakesh Vision, uh, the plan promises that the 47 members will strive to meet 100% domestic renewable energy production as rapidly as possible while working to end energy poverty and protect water and food security, taking into consideration national circumstances. That is a pretty well-rounded statement. That's a goal. That's a laudable goal. Um, yeah, that's a mission statement. Yeah, that is that's a straight up mission statement. Some somebody has an MBA somewhere in there. Uh, the countries involved are keen supporters of keeping the global temperature rise this century under 1.5 C, a target uh, agreed upon during the negotiations in Paris. We are pioneering the transformation towards 100% renewable energy, but we want other countries to follow in our footsteps in order to evade catastrophic impacts we are experiencing through hurricanes, flooding, and drought, said Mr. Matlin Zakras, a minister from the Marshall Islands. Uh, The CFV countries also pledged to update their national climate cutting plans before 2020 and to develop long-term plans as soon as possible. Uh, There's also a hint of impatience among CVF members with the progress being made by richer countries. Quote, we don't know what countries are still waiting for to move towards net carbon neutrality and 100% renewable energy, said Edgar Gutierrez, Costa Rica's Minister for the Environment. All parties should start the transition, otherwise we will all suffer. And uh, then we can just back up the tape to my diatribe on this, and then we're good. Yeah. So, 
There you go. Well, it does, um, real quick, we want to tie into how the Paris Accords come into play here. Yeah. Uh, much of the progress towards meeting these renewable energy goals will depend on finance from richer nations. They have promised that they will contribute $100 billion a year from 2020 as part of the Par- Paris Climate Agreement. However, there are concerns that any possible pullout from the Paris Agreement by the U.S. could impact that fund. While America has promised $3 billion at present for the initial capitalization of the Green Climate Fund, it has only paid some $500 million to date. Donald Trump has promised that he will stop U.S. federal dollars being spent on global warming initiatives. Ah, uh, there it is. Well, somehow he has to pay for all the tax cuts he's promised. Right. This is not the way. But in no. his mind, it is. Well, it's a, it's a me first attitude, and and the NIMBY not in my backyard. So it's not going to happen here. But I don't, I don't care about it happening over there. Those are those are other people, and I don't want other people here. So whatever. I mean, he also thinks that his hotel, his own suite of his hotels, happen to be completely climate controlled and sealed. You know, thinking that CFCs won't somehow magically escape from his hairspray in his room to the outer world. I don't know what he thinks. Yeah, he doesn't know how air works, does he? No. No, he does not. He's a businessman. He has no science background that I can possibly imagine. I can't think of anything scientific that he said. As far as I know, he has no information in that in that zone at all. I don't know what his test scores were. I don't know what classes he took at military school. I don't know that he knows anything other than the book that he co-wrote, The Art of the Deal. He didn't really co-write it. He just sort of had his name attached. Ghostwrite. Yeah, he had somebody ghostwrite it for him, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Which means that he doesn't even know his own business. No. Which is why he's giving it to his kids. So there you go. Okay. Yeah. So that was... um, Gosh, Enlightening. We, we were in. Oh, that was law, <laughs> law and climate. Apparently, law and climate. Um, well, I need to, I need to refresh. I think we need some good ideas. So let's move on to those next. <laughs> 